Um, before I get into my actual presentation, I just thought I would say something. So my other area of specialties, I teach international humanitarian law, which is the law of armed conflict. And I just want to say that white phosphorus is not actually a banned uh, weapon. It is an incendiary weapon and incendiary weapons are not banned under international humanitarian law. They are regulated. So the use of them is regulated. So they're not allowed to be used on civilians. Um, so just, I just wanted to clarify that in the use of that, because I've seen a lot of talk about them being banned under the Geneva Conventions, and that's actually incorrect. So they're not banned under the Geneva Conventions, and they're actually not banned at all, um, but not allowed to be used on civilian areas. So the use that I've seen of them being dropped on forests is not actually illegal use of them, although it may raise issues about destruction of the environment under international law, depending on what happens with the environment there. Um, so, sorry, just <laughs> thought I would clarify that. Um, so, sorry. Thank, thank you for your clarification. I didn't know yeah. it. Yeah, and, and I mean, I mean, my person that I, that's the law, but my personal opinion is that white phosphorus should be banned, um, but it isn't actually. So, P militaries can use incendiary devices for things like um, illuminating a military target or spreading uh, smoke. So they, but they're not allowed to use them against civilians. Yeah, but yeah. that doesn't that doesn't uh, make Azerbaijan innocent because they're still uh, doing like constant shelling on peaceful settlements, archaeological sites, and religious sites. So sure, that and that's a different, but yeah. that's a different thing. So I just wanted to mention yeah, about. Thank you, so thank you. obviously you can't attack civilians. Um, that's prohibited under international humanitarian law. Anyway, so, but uh, <laughs> not giving lectures on IHL today. Um, so I'm just going to share my screen. So hopefully I can uh, get this right um, because it tends to be a little bit difficult picking the right screen. So, okay. Can everyone see the full screen slideshow? Does that work? Yes, yes. thanks. Thanks. Great. Yes, yes. Okay, so I picked this topic because um, I read the call for papers and I was thinking about this idea of what are the challenges that we have today. And the, the challenges that I had doing research fieldwork last year um, is something that I'd been thinking about and, and so I thought actually fit quite well. Um, a lot of us do research and fieldwork on past genocides and that has its own challenges, but I thought, what are the challenges that we're looking at when we're talking about something that's currently going on? And so that's why I thought I would talk about uh, this, the challenges that I faced actually doing fieldwork research with Rohingya refugees. Um, so I, I, I'm just going to, I'm sort of going to go through the challenges I faced at each step. And the first one is before you go there. Um, so these are what I call the pre-travel logistics and getting ready for these kinds of trips. It, it takes a huge amount of work. And so before I went, I had to have some contacts there in Bangladesh. And so luckily enough, through the International Association of Genocide Scholars, we have connections with the Liberation War Museum there. So I was actually heading to Bangladesh to attend a conference at the Liberation War Museum. So I already had those contacts, contacts. So that was a really good place to start. And basically I said to them, you know, I would, I, I, while I'm there, I want to take the advantage of going down to the camps and doing some field work and interviewing refugees there about the genocide uh, in Myanmar. So they said, absolutely, of course, no problem, we'll help you. So that was the first step. And I didn't really have to do too much with regards to that. So I didn't have to give them that much information. I was just uh, basically thinking about dates and when I wanted to go down to Cox's Bazaar. Um, so, you know, I thought, oh, okay, this is all going very smoothly before I went there and I'll, I'll come back to that. Um, so I then had to also organise the travel logistics, which was how do I get down to Cox's Bazaar? Obviously, first of all, how do I get to Bangladesh? Because I was actually coming from Bosnia where I did some field work. And but getting to Cox's Bazaar and so having to get that past my university because um, to get to Cox's Bazaar, you have to fly from 
Dhaka in a small local airline. And so the university considers that kind of travel to be high risk. So I had to get that approved and get that put through to be able to do that. Um, there were also travel logistics once I got there, but I'm going to talk about that um, on the next slide. So accommodation logistics proved to be a bit difficult because I was looking at accommodation in Cox's Bazaar and everything I found was quite expensive and outside of my research budget. So the people at the, Liber you know, I mentioned this to the Liberation War Museum and they said to me that they would help me find something that was reasonably priced. And because basically at the moment, there are a lot of aid organisations, you know, including the UN, uh, who have people who are living in Cox's Bazaar. And so the prices for hotels have gone up quite significantly. And I had a very limited research budget on which I was working. Um, one of the, oh gosh, I'm sorry, it's possible it's a bit noisy. It sounds like my neighbours might be starting to prepare for a party. So that's going to be fun if that's what's happening. Um, uh, sorry, I'm just gonna, um, hold on, yeah. Okay, so the next thing I had was the biggest problem was an ethics application. So my trip to Bosnia and Bangladesh was, was reasonably late notice, which I don't normally do. So normally for field work, I prepare probably a year in advance. Um, but in this case, it, because it was connected to going to a conference in Bosnia and a conference in Bangladesh, it was actually fairly late notice. I only had about two months notice that I was going. So to get my ethics application done in this time was a huge, huge challenge, absolutely massive, because there were certain logistics that I had to organise before I could submit my ethics application, because that information had to go into the ethics application. So I did the ethics application as soon as I could, but I was still cutting it really fine. And basically the ethics committee meets regularly, but I missed the deadline by one day to be assessed in two weeks. And so then it had to wait a month before it got assessed. So I had put in these, I'd put in two applications at the same time, one for Bosnia and one for Bangladesh for my research in each place. And I left Australia and I still did not have the ethics approval. So I was absolutely panicking that I wasn't going to be able to do my research. So I was in Bosnia and I still hadn't got my ethics approval. And they sent me back the, the, the response to my ethics application form and they had about 26 questions for me. So it was really problematic. So I had to address all of these uh, issues that they had raised, some of which were, you know, honestly really not issues at all. But one of the things that they wanted was they wanted my um, participant information sheet and my question form to be translated into local language. Um, and I said to them, but Rohingya isn't a written language, so I can't get this done. Um, and also Rohingya have, have not had access to education, so many of them will actually be illiterate. So in a sense, it it's, doesn't matter if I have a, a written version, but they were adamant that they had to tick this box that I had to have a translation of this. So I was able to get that done through the Liberation War Museum. They kindly found someone who would translate that for me. And I got that done. And I'm gonna come back to that form um, in a bit to tell you where that went. Um, but that was obviously quite a challenge to get that done and get it back to them in time that they could tick that box and say, yes, we give you the ethics application approval. And I actually only got my ethics application approval for the Bosnia trip literally on the morning of the day that I was due to travel and do my first interview. So I was panicking that it wasn't going to happen um, and that I wasn't going to be able to interview the person or that I was going to talk to her and not be able to use the content. So that was, it was, I was actually really, really stressed about it. 
um, but, it, but it came through and then the, the one for my Bangladesh work came through before I got to Bangladesh just. So that was, a, that was a huge thing. And I think in thinking about that, you know, the ethics applications for this kind of work are really quite intensive. There's a lot of information that has to go into them. And so they're not something that you actually can just whip up really quickly because of all the information that they require from them. So that was a significant challenge if, you know, if you, you in a situation like I was with only a couple of months notice for your research. So that was before I got there. So when I got there, I then I was in Dakar and then I made my way down to Cox's Bazaar. And here is what I faced. So I faced bureaucracy and uh, forms for permission to do all this work. Um, so basically there were some things that I was organising while I was in Dakar through the Liberation War Museum and they had gotten from me a letter of permission uh, from uh, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs that I could go to the camps and do my interviews in the camps. And so they said, you know, this is what you need, that's great. So I was like, oh, thank you, that's wonderful. So I got, uh, you know, I had a few copies made of this, so I had some copies of this form in case it was needed. Uh, when I got to the airport, when I got out of the plane at Cox's Bazaar, I had to, because I was a foreigner, I had to give all my details to a, a, a desk there. I'm not really sure, honestly, who they were taking my details. So, you know, this is one of the issues that people want your details, but they don't really tell you who they are. Like, is it a government department? Is it the airport? Like, it, it really wasn't very clear. Um, but they made every foreigner who was coming into the airport there at Cox's Bazaar, give them their details, you know, including their passport details. So there's that issue of, um, you know, personal privacy kinds of issues. Um, so I then had to organise uh, accommodation logistics. And so there's issues of safety um, for me there. So if you see the picture here, this was the view from the first uh, room that I had, which was a room that was booked for me. And you can see that a lot of the hotels are actually not finished being built. And my hotel was like that. So I was in this room and then inside there were areas where, you know, and I was on quite a high floor, as you can see, it was literally open um, and so quite dangerous to be in that area because if you fell over, you, you would have died. Um, so, but, and not just on the outside, but also on the inside of the hotel. So they had the outside, but the inside was completely open. So it was, you know, that was an issue. So also here, it was incredibly noisy. The intersection that you see is basically going 24 hours a day and horns beeping. So I wasn't able to get any sleep. So in the end, I moved to a different hotel because I needed to be able to sleep to, because I was very busy doing the field work every day. And so I needed to make sure that I had enough sleep. Um, so I also had to organize a driver and interpreter. And again, luckily my contacts on the ground, the Liberation War Museum uh, were able to do that for me, which was incredibly helpful. And so um, obviously in, in both cases, so I paid for the, the transport, I paid for the van and I paid for the driver. Um, you know, appropriate local cost for those. And I also paid the interpreters for their time. So I ended up having, because of um, the short notice, um, because even though I had given the War Liberation War Museum notice that I was coming, they didn't actually organise any of this until I got there. So because of the short notice, I ended up having three different interpreters during my time there who were uh, essentially um, students or uh, people who had just graduated, so early career people. And so they were of differing uh, quality of their interpretation um, and also of their professionalism uh, in their and behavior with me. So that's, that's always a challenge if you sort of can't really control uh, who you can get as an interpreter. And so you have this kind of, you know, one day you've got a really good one and the next day you've got, you know, they're okay, but not as good as that you would like them to be. Um, and so challenges that you have with interpreters are things like making sure that they interpret everything uh, that the people you are interviewing are saying. And it's really difficult to get people to do that. Um, because they, I tell them it's not up to you to 
to kind of pick and choose what to tell me that the person said, you need to interpret word for word what that person has said. It's up to me as the researcher to decide what content that I use ultimately. Um, so safety was also an issue getting to the camp. Um, the roads were really terrible and I'm going to show you that um, in a moment. Um, so uh, there were gender dimensions to, to safety and to being around there because um, in Bangladesh, uh, women are quite hidden in society. So I felt quite uncomfortable being a woman and, and being out in public. And so there was an example where I once I decided to walk from my hotel to another hotel for a meeting. Um, and I didn't do that again because I I had, even though I was wearing a scarf, like I was fully covered, I had people yelling comments, um, at, you know, harassing comments at me for the entire seven minutes of the walk that I did. So I felt really uncomfortable and I always took a, a tuk tuk um, after that. Um, so I sort of felt uh, quite restricted in where I could go and what I could do because I was a woman in that case. Uh, so <laughs> getting to the camp, I said I would talk about this. So here are some photos that I took uh, out from the van while we were driving. And it gives you an idea of what the traffic and the roads were like. And basically the roads were either uh, terrible. If you have a look in the bottom left corner, you can see that it's just terrible, terrible road conditions with mud and dirt and huge kind of potholes or sometimes they were paved, but they were really thin roads where basically you couldn't even pass anyone. And there was just so much traffic all over the place all the time. I mean, we, I, I can't believe I didn't actually see an accident, but we witnessed so many near misses that I, I had several heart attacks at times thinking that uh, there were going to be accidents. Uh, we did actually have an accident, but it was so minor. It was almost amusing and it was in the camp and it was actually on a decent road and there was, basically no one around and one of the, the tuk-tuks uh, rolled back down the hill and hit our stationary bus, our, our stationary van, which was, of all the accidents we could have had, it was kind of hilarious um, because, as I said, there were other times when I was like, oh, we're really panicking that we were going to have an accident. So this is obviously something that is important to think about because as researchers, you know, there are times when our safety is at risk in these conditions. And for example, one of the days when we were going to camp, like my driver was really quite good, but one day we were going to have a meeting with UN women. And so we followed them to the camps because it's, it's very difficult to give directions about where to go in the camps. And the UN women driver, they were in this four wheel drive was absolutely hammering at full speed on these really unsafe roads and we actually ended up losing them because they went so fast and it was just not safe for us to be going at the speed that they were going at. Okay so once we're in the camps there are even more logistics. So there was camp bureaucracy. So it turned out that the letter I had from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs wasn't actually the letter that I needed. Um, apparently, I technically should have had a letter from a different division that, di that is basically kind of running the camps. And I also should have had that stamped by about eight or nine particular people, whoever they may have been. And I didn't have that. So, but I didn't know that because I'd been told that this letter I had from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs was going to be enough and you would think it would be enough. So uh, basically I ended up being really lucky that I was still able to get in even without having uh, you know all these stamps on, on the correct piece of paper. So it worked out to be okay but I was really really lucky and I wouldn't recommend to anyone in the future to try doing it without getting the appropriate permissions. Uh, because obviously if you go all that way and they don't let you in, then it's problematic. Now, in terms of, I talk about letting you in, there, it's actually a conglomeration of multiple camps. So it's not just one camp and each camp is run by what's called the CIC, the camp in charge, which I know doesn't technically make sense, but it's the person in charge of that, that camp. And so when you arrive at each camp, if that's the camp you're going to, you have to go and see the 
the camp in charge and they have to approve that you're there. And so sometimes I had some issues with that. Um, like I would go and see them. There was one uh, camp where I had already been to see them. They had already said, yep, no problem. And then I was uh, in the middle of doing what was a really, really useful, really good interview. And some random person basically on a power trip came over and interrupted me and was saying, oh, you have to go back to the camp in charge. Um, and so I had to stop my interview, unfortunately, and go back to the camp in charge. And I'd already been there. So it was essentially a bit of a waste of time. Um, there were, uh, again, gender dimensions to, uh, the interview process. So I was interviewing only women um, simply because I, I had chosen to do that because I had a very limited amount of time available uh, for my research. So I thought I will limit it and, and I will only focus on women. But it ended up being really difficult. If you if you see the photograph in the top right corner, you know, there's a, you can see the children and everyone there and I'm sitting outside. So uh, often, basically, people would be really, really curious because there was a foreigner there in the camps. And so uh, frequently, we would have men appear and, and stand around trying to listen to the interview. And that wasn't appropriate because, of course, I was doing interviews with women and you have to be really gender sensitive to, uh, you know, gender dimensions and their experience. So frequently, I would have to stop and I would have to ask my interpreter to ask the men to leave. Um, so that was quite an interesting one. Um, so doing the interviews, I said I would come back to talking about ethics, um, the, my ethics application and the interviews. So there were some really interesting components to this. So you'll remember I said they made me um, get a translated version. And interestingly, when I got there, my interpreters who were used to going into the camps and talking to the people there said, do not show them the translated version. Show them only the English version because the translated version was translated into Bengali and they said, do not show that to the Rohingya people. They won't like it. They won't want to see it. They'll be worried about that. So after all, I actually really didn't need a translated version at all for this. So we just used the English versions. And what we did was because obviously the majority of Rohingya are illiterate because they've been denied education for so many years, we didn't ask them to read it. We walked them through it. And that's usually what I do when I'm doing interviews with genocide survivors anyway, because this isn't about what's written on a piece of paper. It's about a personal connection and a relationship that you make with the people you interview. So we, we talked them through what was in the pieces of paper. And I had taken an ink pad with me and they uh, used their thumb and uh, stamped instead of signing the, the forms. But a really important thing to note, an interesting thing that happened was that one woman had agreed to be interviewed and then her husband came out and he saw that we had a form and he refused to let her be interviewed because he was terrified that this form had something to do with sending them back to Myanmar. Because for them, a piece of paper that someone had to sign or put, you put their thumbprint on, their fingerprint on, that's what that meant. It was about, it was some kind of formality to, to get them sent back. So he wouldn't let her be interviewed. And that made me realize that this idea of having a written form that someone has to sign, it's a really Western concept of what is ethical. And it's really based on the idea of um, essentially a literate person in a Western country who's, who's doing medical or, or health kind of research. You know, so for example, if I was volunteering in a trial for a vaccination or something like that. You know, because then I'm going to read it and I'm going to see, okay, what are the risks for me with this? Um, so it's very, very different to the personal connection that you need to have with genocide survivors, but also thinking about the fact that there are other things going on and what would have been more ethical for me to do is to simply get a verbal agreement from them rather than a piece of paper. Um, I mentioned the interruptions uh, that we had um, from people, but we also had interruptions, for example, if there was call to prayer, then uh, a lot of the women would leave uh, if I was doing a group. So I would lose a lot of my, um, a lot of my people, or there would be people walking around with megaphones, making announcements, you know, for example, oh, there's rice available um, now. 
Um, and obviously, you know, I mentioned that, that privacy, uh, in, but in the context of these gender dimensions, you know, but everybody coming to kind of see what was going on. Um, food and sanitation was an issue as well. So I was really, really lucky that um, I work here. I volunteer with the Australian Red Cross and uh, there's someone on the committee with me who has done work in the camps. So I was really lucky to have her advice and she had advised me to take food with me. And so I actually took food with me from Australia. I took it all the way to Bosnia and then to Bangladesh, which sounds ridiculous. But the thing is, I was going to be super busy in Bosnia, like I knew I wouldn't have time. And so I was just taking things like muesli bars, so food that I knew would keep, but also I could carry with me as an individual on the day. Um, and, and so, and we had to bring plenty of water because basically there isn't really access to food and water when you get there. So you, you need to make sure that you've got food with you, you know, kind of food with protein, that kind of thing that's gonna keep you going during the day. Um, and it is a really long day because the camps are nowhere near Cox's Bazaar. It's a really long trip to get there on very difficult roads um, and to get back. So it's a, it's a full day that you're doing. And so you need to make sure that you've got some food to keep you going. And obviously for my interpreter as well um, and driver. Um, in terms of sanitation, the sanitation facilities, thinking about toilets in the camps differs depending on which camp. The older camps, the ones that have been there longer have better facilities. So I actually used a flushing toilet with toilet paper um, in those, and but a very different situation when you're getting to the more the newer camps that aren't as well established. Um, and so they don't have those kind of facilities. So you do have to make sure that you're carrying, you know, tissues, toilet paper, that kind of thing with you. Um, because obviously, you know, you at some point are going to need to use the bathroom. Um, and so, uh, yeah, essentially you're looking at basic squat toilets in some of them. So just to finish up, uh, thinking about confronting these challenges, one of the essential things is that you have local contacts. Honestly, you can't do this kind of research without it. It's just impossible. Um, I would also recommend, and this is not just based on my um, research in Bangladesh, but in other countries, is really try and organise an interpreter in advance, if possible, um, because I have had such problems on the ground getting interpreters um, in places like Cambodia and getting it to work out. Um, so if you can do that before you get there, I highly recommend that. Um, also do your ethics applications as soon as possible, um, as soon as you can. As I mentioned, you know, that was a, that was a huge issue. Um, I do think there's a need to reform ethics processes um, for research that, you know, is, is not in Western countries and is not medical kind of related. I think they need to stop uh, working within a rigid, uh, you know, we've got to tick every box, um, you know, and they need to start thinking about, hang on, what would be ethical in this situation? Uh, talk to people who've been there. That was the most helpful for me. As I mentioned, you know, having an Australian here who I could talk to about what it's like in the camps. That was honestly, uh, it was invaluable information for me. And, and I don't think I would have been as well prepared, anywhere near as well prepared without that um, discussion with her. Um, however, I do want to say be prepared that others will not be as organised as you are, as I discovered when I got to Dakar and found that um, none of the organisation had been done around my work there. Um, I actually had a similar thing in Bosnia as well. So just be prepared that even though you may have given someone two months notice, they haven't actually done the things that need to be done for, for your work to be done. Um, but despite that, be very organised at your end, do everything that you need to do um, as much as you possibly can do before you get there so that you are well prepared. And I've probably gone over time, <laughs> there's so much to talk about, um, but thanks everyone uh, and